Legend of Zelda Tears of a Kingdom is one game that I have been waiting for for such a long time. The first game that I have ever played within the Zelda series was Breath of the Wild and honestly I just never grew up on any of the games. So when I finally got into Twitch, all I could do is just basically watch the streams of people actually play the game. And honestly, it was after that that I fell in love even more with the series than I have already come to really like it in Breath of the Wild. Hello, what's up and welcome everyone. My name is Miss Quinn and before we begin, it goes without saying that this video will contain massive spoilers for everything like story, boss battles, where to get the Master Sword, and so on. This video has been a long one in the making and with that, please go get your snacks, get your drinks, and let's begin. Tears in the Kingdom, as we all know, is a sequel to Breath of the Wild, a game where we had to defeat Calamity Ganon, alongside the champions Mipha, Urbosa, Daruk, and Rivali, who a lot of times I have been calling Ravioli just because I didn't like him. You had to basically get help from them if that's something you were aiming for, and for me, who completely sucks at video games, I totally went for it. In Tears of the Kingdom, however, we have help from five sages. Tulin, who is the son of Tiba from Breath of the Wild, Riju, the Gerudo chief, Prince Sidon, the brother of Mipha, Unibo, a descendant of Daruk, and Minoru, someone who has fought Ganondorf before. The sages, according to my good friend, were introduced in Ocarina of Time, and there were seven sages. We obviously know that in Tears of the Kingdom, there were also seven sages, but we only really seek out five of them. And the fifth one is really only sought after, after you basically acquire the four other sages, which is Tulin, Riju, Sidon, and Unibo. Minoru isn't sought out until after. When going to places like the temples and fighting their bosses, it was honestly really refreshing coming from Breath of the Wild. Everyone had basically the same coat of paint, just slapped on with a different element, and there you go just with a little bit of different tactic. I did go for Tulin first, which unfortunately I don't have any recordings of the battle since I went for him before I even started streaming my gameplay. Okay, just for you guys, I went back and fought Calgara in the depths, okay? When I wanted this to be over and done with, and I did it all for you guys, just because I didn't have footage of the battle with Calgara, and I didn't have footage, obviously, the battle in, you know, basically, you know, the Wind Temple. But essentially, what you had to do for Calgara was shoot three parts of his you know of his body the ones that are circled you should be seeing an image here obviously you have to shoot them three times as it's shooting its scale or its spikes at you which are basically rocks now you have to maneuver yourself around which is why you have you really you need tooling so much because of his gust of wind so he pushes you away and when he disappears into the portal, you need to look down because he's going to appear right below you. And you're going to have to need, you know, your camera looking downwards. And as soon as you see the portal popping up, have Tulin push you away. That way you can avoid a hit. Also, the second phase is when Colgara takes out his little whirlwind powers. And that's when you say no. 
all right permission is everything and you basically have to duck and weave the whirlwinds again using tulin now if you have um what's it called there, there's a certain thing oh yeah if you have the glide shirt it helps tremendously because it helps a lot with your gliding which i didn't have that within the first fight but i did have that here you know in the ones that you're seeing and this honestly did help it you know helps with easier gliding with the wind and i honestly really liked it and as you see here i did not want to fight him again okay i already got turned into a hashtag down there so i really didn't want to happen again and as it was coming up what i realized i can shoot it like i can shoot its belly as it's coming up or as it's going down so i took full on advantage that its belly you know those parts were exposed and i used it so i can shoot it quicker and it did honestly work it was really challenging but honestly i really like this this battle and with that Colgaro was defeated and i wanted to dance on its grave and show it who's boss the second one that i went for was queen gipto who is in the gerudo desert now again coming from breath of the wild i thought all the bosses of the temples were going to be similar to Colgaro just with a different coat of paint and then them calling it a day but i was so wrong queen gipto is basically a, a giant very angry beetle who is tired of you trying to swat it and is seeking revenge for all its family members all jokes aside however in breath of the wild thunder blight was actually the hardest for me but again the bosses were all the same to me just with a tad a bit you know change to their appearance in tears of the kingdom however they do not only look completely different, but the method of how you beat them is also completely different. You have to rely on Riju in order to defeat it with her lightning. Once the Gyptos are basically being called out from their hives, which you can tell when it starts to glow pink, that's when you shoot it and you rely on the light that it beams down in order to render the Gyptos useless and slap it like an angry reddit mod. The third temple on my to-do list in order to beat the boss was the fire temple since I said hell to the no to the water one. Marveled Guma or Goma wasn't actually like it wasn't exactly a walk in the park however with me still meeting the Grim Reaper you know just a couple of times you know to be really acquaintances however you basically have to hit two of its legs in order for him to fall and then after that you basically get on top of the rock portion and then just keep smacking its eyeball and that's essentially what you do in the first phase now in the second phase it's a bit more difficult because he goes up to the ceiling that's when you have to use Unibo you know his his thing you know to curl up into a ball like a roly-poly you basically have to get him and do trick shots with him and hope that you're hitting two of its legs in order for him to go back down now for me after dying so much and after being you know just a little too too many deaths too many loads of panic i just shot randomly and hoped for the best and surprisingly though that worked and yes i was so happy to get it done because it it lasted longer than i thought it was gonna last in all honesty now i'm not going to lie when death after death after death after death hit me i wanted to avoid mokturak like the plague like i became best friends with the grim reaper at this point i thought he was so cute and so silly when you get him out of the sludge shark like you know his flailing tentacles are just hilarious he's just running around and everything and you hit him once he falls over and then you basically gang up on him with the rest however this little demon spawn is the epitome of don't judge a book by its cover because holy hell it made me want to scream i swore so many times that it was even too much for my twit my twitch chat who are used to me swearing every now and then like there's even a channel redemption called bad quinn stop swearing or no swearing i forgot i'll put it on the freaking screen for you but this little 
demon spawn overtook my anger and sent it into overdrive. I, I honestly, I stopped streaming, obviously because streaming, streaming days were over, but I looked at that Mokhtarok so many times in its territory, and I was like, you know what, you will not get the best of me. I played it offline after farming so many bomb arrows and just like not bomb arrows my bad i went so you see how angry i get with this thing i went after farming so many bomb bomb flowers in the depths and so many arrows i i just i just went off i went off i got some hearts and i headed off to battle like i had been training endlessly for i didn't want to let mukturak out of my sight for just a second like in the second phase because once it's in the second phase it goes back into the sludge and swims around in it so fast you cannot keep up with it when you're like walking regularly but guess what it was offline when i finally realized yo quinn you know there's low gravity yes and that's what i used in order to fight this wretched little <laughs> little demon spawn i finally clicked and made use of the zero gravity and once i remember that i would jump up keep spamming the water plants in order to like evaporate the water and then just start spamming that one with just bomb flowers one after the other after the other i did not want him to go like, dude, you made a fool out of me for one too many times, and I was not going to let that pass. Now, the final one after, you know, you get all four, you know what happens. You have to go to Hyrule Castle, discover that the Zelda that everyone has been seeing is not the actual Zelda. You go to the Spirit Temple. And honestly, going there right after basically fighting Mukturok, I learned something precious. I learned never let your enemy move so that's what i did i made sure that along the way i got a cannon that was fresh that was not used and that's what i used for the entirety of the fight i just as soon as it started moving nope shot it with a cannon went in and then kept smashing and smashing it until it hit the side of the barb electric barbed wire so it can take even more damage now in the second phase, he does start flying, but again, I used my cannon to bring that seize construct down, and then I went for it. I did the same thing over and over again. Why? Because I was still feeling hot and fresh from Mukturok, okay? I learned my, my lesson. I learned my lesson. Never let your enemy move, okay? That's the lesson for today. Once they start moving, they can get the better of you, and plus, I will say, it's pretty scary like the spirit um the spirit temple boss it, the seas construct is basically scary because it grows to other arms and then it just starts flying but once you get the hang of you know maneuvering minoru it should be fairly simple considering that you do have to go through various enemies in order for you to actually get to the boss all right you just don't go there get the secret stone and that's it no you have to go through various enemies and then actually fight them i did think this was really annoying but once i saw the seas construct i was actually pretty happy that i had all that little mini training before i got to the actual boss and now that you know we're talking this is specifically solely about the temple bosses if I had to say which one was my favorite, even though it brought me endless amounts of nightmares and anger and more white hairs than I can count, I would honestly go with Mokhtarok as my favorite. And that is saying a lot because like I said, in Breath of the Wild, for me, Blight Gant, like Thunder Blight Gant, it was actually my favorite because he was so fast. like, And it was just hard you had to really think about the way that you were going to go about them but with this one i i would i would switch it i would put Mokhtarok as my first because it was it was tricky and it was something that again you just want to get in there boom 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 get out 
but you had to actually think about the way that you were going to go about it. I didn't really rely on Sidon's power whatsoever, you know, with the whole shield thing. I mostly relied on the zero gravity, the bomb flowers, the water flower, like the water flowers, you know, the splash ones, splash fruits, and that's it. That's all I mostly relied on because I, the, like, I wanted to spend less time as possible on the ground because that's what kept getting me and getting me. So I was thinking, you know what? The less time I spend on the ground, more time I spend on the air, the better because that's when I activate slow-mo and that's when I can actually get them. My second one, I honestly think I will put Queen Gibdo just because the Gibdos, once they're on the floor, they start crawling to you like an angry horror villain. And it's freaky. It's freaky seeing them just crawl to you. It's like, it is. Like, go, go away. I would put the Seize Construct as, honestly, my third. My fourth one would have to be Kolgera for, you know, for the Wind Temple. And the last one, unfortunately, would have to be the Fire, the Marbled go Goma. I, I don't know. I loved it so much. I did really like it and enjoy it and it did present its own challenges however when compared to all these other temple bosses for me at least like i'm sorry Mukturak would have to be my number one even though he was my number one in the bane of my existence as well and the reason why i need therapy at night Now that we talked about their bosses, it only seems fair to talk about the temples in which they taunt us in. We all know that, we really don't want to sometimes go there, but we still go there. Anyway, many of them looking outright just gorgeous. I mean, the developers have done such a great job with this game and these temples. And honestly, many have been happy about the themed temples from what I hear. The legendary Stormwind Arc, or better known as the Wind Temple, is an absolute blast to get to. Obviously, the clips that you guys are watching are from after I beat the Spirit Temple. But as you see, the design of the giant boat is stunning and made even more so by all the little boats around it that help you get onto the big boat. Honestly, for me, I think what I like most about this temple in particular is the profile. The profile is what really sticks out for me and is just absolutely gorgeous when introduced because you're seeing it from the bottom as like a big storm cloud but when you get to the top and especially when you finally beat you know um the boss it just looks stunning to see it without the big ass storm the small puzzles are great there are a total of five things you need to activate with tulin's gust ability there are a total of three levels in this awesome boat you know, obviously the first level, and then basement one, then basement two. Honestly, the main things I used during this portion of the temple were the ultra hand, rewind, you know, the recall ability, and ascend. Those are the three things that I mostly used. And yes, the little levers that you are seeing right here, I kept whacking them when I could have just used ultra hand just to stick something on there and move it. And yes, I felt kind of slow. I'm sorry. The Lightning Temple offers its own set of challenges. Now, before we get to those challenges, however, we do need to first head over there, which involves, you know, basically bouncing a light off of three pillars to create a triangle. And in the middle, something will appear that obviously only Reju's power can help you reveal, and it brings up the temple, and guess what? The big-ass beetle is hiding in there. First, let me say that Ultra Hand and Recall are the two things I mostly use here. I did also use the Fuse ability for my weapons, of course, but those, at least for me, were the two main things that I saw myself using a lot. There are eight floors plus one basement floor that relies on, <laughs> you guessed it, Riju's power of lightning or Raiju. You know, I just call her Riju. I'm so sorry. Anyway. Use her lightning to charge up these batteries here, and once you get all of them, you get onto moving the Queen Beetle. I mean Queen Gipto. Yeah, Queen Gipto, that's what I said. Now, I'm going to rewind a bit because I bet you're wondering, well, is the temple easy? Because it was a easy run for me. Honestly, it was somewhat, you just had to figure out, you know, how to bounce the light 
to certain pathways in order to open up gates and things like that in order to get to the battery. So you, this will be, you know, the parts where you need to ascend and use Alter Hand and stuff like that. However, recall is especially important for one part of the puzzle that I found myself being confused by. But yeah, after you charge up all four batteries, you should be uh, ascending straight to hell. <sighs> the fire temple. What, what can I say about this hellish nightmare? It is located in the depths underneath, you know, Death Mountain. Of course, where else would it be located? Anyway, this made me want to scream from how confused I was. Not lying, it took me a little over an hour to try and get through everything. I ended up using a rocket shield to get to high places fast since I couldn't be bothered to figure out how the minecarts work. I, that was a whole confusion on its own. Okay. Anyway, climbing and the rocket shields were my best friends since honestly I suck at building hovercrafts and there was this one point in the stream where I legit had to pull up a walkthrough on how to get through the fire temple and it was confusing even to me because I went all over the place. And until I finally found out how the hell he got to the last one. I ended up getting really annoyed with myself since a great chunk of when I used the rocket shield, something was right above me and I wouldn't look for some reason before doing, you know, rocketing up. And yeah, Link kept hitting his, like hitting his head and I would lose the rocket. You know how horrible I felt every time I lost a rocket because I would whack my head on something? Anyway, there are five locks, you know, which you have to release by hitting you by using Unibo's ability to become a deadly roly poly. But now that I rewatch my gameplay for this video, I now know why it was so hard for me. I literally have to stop overthinking everything. Like all these little things could have been easily breezed through had I just stopped, relaxed, opened my head and stop thinking inside the box. Well, actually, no, technically I tried to think outside of the box for many different ways. And really, I think that, well, that is what, you know, became the death of me at the very end. The water temple was absolutely fun to me because of the zero gravity. So I felt like the astronaut I was always meant to be. Anyway, I wanted to stay there for the jumping and for the fact that, you know, I had Sidon next to me because look at that smile. Look at that smile, guys. There is no way you can look at him and be like, no, nah, I don't want to be next to him. Anyway, you have to use his water shield ability to get the faucets turning. There are four of these that you have to complete in the first floor and the basement, you know, to get rid of the sludge, which pled plagues the Zora domain. There was one part of the water temple that I'm showing you right now that I spent an unnecessary amount of time with this one. Now, like I said, when it comes to me overthinking everything, I didn't remember for some reason that there's that Link has a slow motion ability when he jumps and pulls out the arrow. Okay, remember, this is, was also my downfall when it came to battling Moktorok. I for completely forgot about the slow motion and I spent so many damn arrows when I could have just jumped into the air and made it a whole lot easier. So much of my brain felt like a hamster in a wheel desperately trying to run. Like what in the absolute f <sighs> Okay, okay. You know, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Anyway, the spirit temple is another temple located in the depths. No lie, when I first saw this without knowing this was to build Minoru's body, I thought it was just a weird looking egg and I thought I could move it, but I couldn't. So I was like, hmm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to need this later on in the story if I just like stop messing around and just continue on. So guess what? That's what I did. But in order to know where it is, you know, without going through every inch of the depths like me, you'll have to go through the Thunderhead Isles and it, basically you have to make it all the way to the dragon head island and use a five no sorry no not five hearts you have to use 10 hearts in order to open up a s huge set of doors to reveal the mask that minoru herself wore all those years ago now this part for me was great because i finally had link 
you know, being able to hear someone speak to him, because all this time we were hearing people speak to Unibo, to Tulin, to Sidon, to Riju, and no one actually spoke to Link all this time. But Minoru was the only one that was actually speaking to Link. And for me, I loved it, especially because she was just like, Link. <laughs> I'm sorry. She was just like, Link, Zelda's chosen protector. And, and I lost it. I was like, oh, yes, Minoru, talk dirty to me. <laughs> anyway, now, apart from that, the way down to the Spirit Temple was an absolutely beautiful cutscene. And it made me think, how the hell did they build all of this to make it work? What kind of contractors did they use? Because I, I want to know. I want to know that. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, what I did were like all the little puzzles in order to get the four limbs to build Minerva's body. And yes, instead of building a bear, we are building a body. But you do feel accomplished once it's all over. And then you go to fight the seized construct. Now, the deaths were a part of the game that I thought I could avoid. I even refused to go there unless I really needed to. I hated the deaths so much I was scared every time I would go in. I can't see anything. Your available hearts get smaller the more you get damaged by gloom or enemies. The more impossible, you know, climbing walls. And what the heck is this thing? Whew. However, what I will say is once you get as many light roots as you can, it's no longer scary. It provides you with a certain comfort and sense of security, like a big burrito blanket just like wrapping all over you. Or, you know, that's what it felt like to me. The game reminds me of that quote, you know, when you're lost in the darkness, look for the light. You know, but instead of flyer flies, we're looking out for pose, bright bloom fat flowers, deep flies, lights from the mines, or light roots, which thank you, whoever made these mines. I was throwing bright bloom flowers all over the place, okay, before I completed the miner's outfit because it, well, the miner's outfit provides an in a really good you know radius of light but if you don't have that honey just keep throwing those bright blooms all over the place because it yeah you need light get your get your you know bow and arrow attach a bright bloom to that and then fire away okay and i can't believe i'm saying this but i'm grateful that the gloom glows because at least it lets me know where I can't step on, you know, on rather flat surfaces or even where I should avoid climbing because like I said, it does glow from far away. So that's your own like little warning sign. When one wrong step or one hit means saying goodbye to a healthy heart, the depths is something I desire to avoid. Like I said in the beginning, you see activating a light route it does cure your broken hearts as, you know, as it does stepping underneath an already activated one. But this is where you have to rely on cooking up some sundelion. Now, this beautiful flower is the key to restoring hearts that were rendered useless because of the gloom. All right. You can also get the depths armor set, which will grant you a bunch of resistant to gloom. But if you can't get that or just have two pieces like me, well, yeah, you t cook up some of that sweet, sweet sundelion. I swear, whenever I was like one heart, the only one heart available, in my head, I was thinking of that Linkin Park song, you know, one step closer to the edge and I'm about to break. A lot of cool outfits are hidden within the depths, which makes me want to scream since again, I want to ignore the depths. Why do you put such cool outfits in the depths if I want to avoid you? My purpose is to just pretend you don't exist just for the small bits amount of times where I do need to see that you exist. <sighs> you know, but besides the outfits that either are for looks or for straight benefits, you know, 
you can ra ravel in the beauty that the dragons do go into the depths. Well, only three of them. And sorry for my pronunciations I'm going to do here, people, but Nadra, you know, the frost dragon, Ferosh, the lightning dragon, and Dinral, the fire dragon, have their own roots within the depths. Or routes. How do you say that? I say roots. What do you say? I say, let's go with routes. Anyway, the only dragon to never go down there is the light dragon, aka Zelda. Not going to lie, I was wondering if that may be because a part of her might have remembered the darkness she felt when she was falling in the beginning. I mean, yeah, she didn't actually fall, but she was being swallowed up by it. Maybe that's not it. You know, maybe the devs just didn't want another dragon down there since it'd be too much to make their own route and everything, else, you know, such as that. It just makes sense to me, you know, that she wouldn't want to be down there. But, you know, it just gets me wondering about the other dragon bones that we see down there because those aren't the only dragons that go down there, wink, wink, or have gone down there. Overall, once I got all of the light roots in order to brighten the place up, so to speak, you know, instead of pimp my ride, it was pimp my depths. And I could appreciate the beauty of the depths. Underneath all the dark and gloom, the depths are surprisingly comforting. Yes, even I found them surprisingly comforting after a while, and I started spending time in there a lot more than I usually thought I would. Again, this is only because I got as many light roots as possible, so I was able to truly enjoy exploring this time. Now I was going to the mines and going to, you know, the Yiga clan's hideout so I can get more freaking schematics. But the only thing I still don't enjoy is the fact that once you beat the temple bosses and you think it's all over, you know, it's not. No, it is not. They reappear in the depths, you know, in the little arenas that you see here. And it's bad enough that we had to fight, you know, Queen Gipto, Mukturok once, but three separate times? I already fought Kalgera two separate times since I wanted to record the battle for this video, which means I in turn fought that for you. So please, don't let my headaches be in vain. The memories within Tears of the Kingdom made me hopeless right away. Now, if you made it this far into the video, then you know what happens with Zelda. And by that, I mean that she accidentally, you know, time travels back into time after falling from the imprisoning chamber. After going back in time, however, she meets King Braru and Queen Sonya, the founders of Hyrule, and Zelda's goal is ultimately to go back to her own time. That's when Braru introduces Zelda to his sister Minoru, and she mentions that the secret stone actually only possesses the power to amplify her own power. However, even though she possesses both light and time powers, it is only basically amplifying her time and power, which is what made her stuck in the first place. However, she does mention a forbidden act called dr dratification, I really hope I pronounced that right, where swallowing a secret stone actually turns you into a mortal dragon. Now, surely it is a way to get to her time, but a strikingly slow way of going back to her own time. However, in watching that memory, it became painfully obvious that that's where the game was going to be headed. Now, I absolutely love and enjoyed the story of the game. Afterwards, we see Daddy Ganondorf on, uh, did I really write that? <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, Ganondorf, I meant Ganondorf. Anyway, this is important because this is when Ganondorf attacks, but is quickly shut down by Rauru. The only way he does this is because Sonya and Zelda lend him their power, but in this exact moment, it is amazing to me. Zelda right here obviously has such a stronger power than Sonya that even Zelda herself is surprised. Which, if we do remember Breath of the Wild, this shouldn't come as to no shock to the player, 
because remember zelda went through the entirety of the game thinking she was not good enough and that she could never awaken her power so it makes sense that this will carry on a little bit into this game and even though this did lead to a good thing, their actions, however, had dire consequences. Because Ganondorf, who seems to have a better eyesight than an eagle to where he can see all their secret stones, that gives him the push to falsely pledge his loyalty to Rauru after insulting him, you know, as one surely, surely does. Like, that didn't go wrong in Game of Thrones, so why shouldn't that go wrong here? Through these memories, we see the struggles that Zelda is currently going through in the past. Her big heart, and in my opinion, crush towards Link, is obvious when Zelda and Sonya are having a conversation. Then Zelda proceeds to talk, you know, about Link to Raru, which is the cutest thing I have ever seen. Watching Zelda completely gush about Link and basically saying how amazing he is, is the most adorable thing ever. The cuteness was only amplified when Raro seemed super interested in meeting Link. And he seemed like a dad, because he's just like, Whoa, who's Link? This is a name I've never heard of before. You know, he just seems so intrigued. And I did like that. They really took an interest in Zelda, and it shows that the bond that they have quickly created. Afterwards, Sonya actually meets Zelda in private after being asked to. In this moment, the curtain drops and the charade is over, because it's found out that that was actually a puppet of Ganondorf sent to turn Sonya into a past tense. Even though it is discovered that the fake Zelda is just a puppet, Ganondorf does manage to sneak up behind Sonya and basically turn her into a hashtag himself, all because he wanted the secret stone and go from Daddy Ganondorf to the Demon King, and becomes the reason why all these monsters were made. No lie, however, I love the fact that we have an origin story for all the monsters, you know, and how they were created that we have to fight up against. However, we could do without these, you know, one-hit wonders, but, you know, I guess you have to come up with a few weak ones and get a few strong ones. It's kind of like a balance thing, I guess. Now, it's not after we beat the, se the seized construct, does Minoru tell Link about the moment Zelda told her about her plans to swallow the secret stone, even though, like I said, this was basically hinted on because, you know, she really seemed kind of on the fence, you know, Zelda. And like I said, it did, it did, was obvious how, how this game was going to go about. It's obvious that Minoru expresses her disapproval and reminding her that the act is forbidden because she could lose herself to the transformation. The transformation changes you by essentially making you lose yourself and why would you want to do that when you lose the reason why you're doing it in the first place? Now, believing that she was sent back in time in order to repair the Master Sword, there is no changing her mind. She truly is ready to sacrifice herself in order to save the Hyrule she knows, and by extension, Link. It's at this moment that Minoru gives her word to aid Link in the future for his quest to defeat the Demon King. Now, before I move on from the story, I do want to mention that I am not a theory channel. That being said, I've seen how many people are saying that Zelda shouldn't exist. This is because, you know, of Sonya being a part of the Tombstone community and of King Raru also being part of that said exclusive club later on. But if we remember with movies such as Back to the Future or shows like The Umbrella Academy, there is actually a reason to be said about this madness. Now, heavy spoiler warning for The Umbrella Academy. If you have not seen, you know, the last season, which is season three, please click and go to the, you know, the timestamp on the video that I am showing on the screen right here. We're good now? Cool. Now, if you watch the Umbrella Academy, it's no surprise to you that in season three, Five discovers that it was him who founded basically, you know, the community of time travelers in the first place, which ironically he fucking hates. It's here in the season that we are told about the grandfather paradox, 
Now, stay with me here because it could be a bit complicated. Basically, Elmer, not wanting to deal with his grandpa in the present, goes back in time to shoot him. The bad part is that he goes back too far in time to where he wasn't even born yet. Now, when shooting his grandpa, he made it to where he wasn't even born. But this is where the concept of a parallel universe comes into play. Because he was never born, that means he was never able to kill his grandpa. Therefore, he was still born and his grandpa still exists, making them stuck in this never-ending loophole where he kills his grandpa every time, but he also dies, but he's not dead. Again, this is creating a parallel universe as to where he's safe in his own original time, but he basically created a parallel universe because of the ripple effect. I have never been so scrambled in the brain before, but like I said, stay with me. Or we can be looking at a back to the future scenario when the only reason why Zelda still exists is because their children are somewhere else. Remember, we don't know how old Raru or Sonya are. They could literally have grown up adults by now who are just somewhere else. Remember, Yona, Sidon's fiance, even states that she's from somewhere else, that she traveled from a different place. So is this theory really too far off? Are we really just simply gonna write this off? Is it too far-fetched to just say, hey, maybe Sonya and Raru's kids are somewhere, somewhere else and somewhere safe, which is the only reason why Zelda's still alive? Because remember, in that action where Ganondorf attacks, the only thing we'll be taking out of that scenario is Zelda. But Raru and Sonya will still do what they're going to do and, you know, basically put up the middle fingers to Ganondorf, still leading Ganondorf to go to that specific location. And, you know, say, oh yes, my loyalty is to you, but in reality, he's just plotting their downfall. Not to mention that in the very, very beginning of this time period, we see in the first cutscene that this was meant to happen all along. And then when we go to fight Ganondorf and we finally reveal, you know, those basically that big, big blockage, we can see that this still happens. Sonya still dies and Zelda still swallows the secret stone. Now, the memories and by extension, the story in this game are overall great. It made me cry and truly appreciate the time that the developers took into making this game. However, I do have one problem with the memories in specifically. Specifically. Listen, I, I'm, it's too early. I get that you can get the memories in order if you go to the Forgotten Temple because it does show you. However, if you're like me and over 50% of other players, you are getting these completely out of order. That does drastically affect how we take in the story and can lead us to taking in important cutscenes first. Now, when it comes to activating things like the shrine, they literally block you off. So why couldn't they implement something like that just with the memories? Like making the next memory available only when you had the previous memory activated. I just think that would have been much better. It would have saved a lot of people activating important like memories first and stuff like that however you know i just think it would have been much better besides that though i truly love the story and i felt so bad for zelda knowing everything she went through just to try and get herself back to link then when she realized she wasn't able to be back and her hope was lost she did the only thing she felt like she could and that was swallow the secret stone and restore the Master Sword in order to give it to Link. Getting to the point of where you have to start this battle is ridiculous. And I only say that because of the amount of times I died. The I kept getting lost every time I had to go there. And try, try doing that while getting slammed with a bunch of enemies that look at you and say, Hey, you know what? It's lunchtime. I'm feeling like I need some Hylian today. This battle has four total stages. 
and they have to be cleared out before the next wave appears. Now, the order of which they show up is Bokoblins, you know, doesn't matter, blue, red, silver, they all show up there, obviously with their black Bokoblin boss, because why would they show up alone? They have to be with somebody. Up next is a pack of Lizalfos, a swarm of these beautiful, creepy Gibdos, which honestly, fighting them once was enough and I could not stand fighting them again. And the last stage is the Moblins. Now, I will say this battle is a whole lot easier if you have elemental weapons with you because they will deal way more damage than actual normal weapons. So it not only helps with the Gibdos, but it also helps with all of them in general. I mean, with the Gibdos, you hit them with the elemental weapons first, and then you go in with the actual attacks because it weakens them. Well, in this case, go make sure you have elemental weapons for everybody. I obviously went to electrocute all of them because I didn't want anyone to touch me. But of course, my thing was to run around and have the sages fight some of that as well for me. Now, speaking of the sages, can I just say that before this battle with the Demon King's army, there is a beautiful, beautiful cutscene that made my heart skip a beat with how many goosebumps I was receiving. And the fact that Minru's you know, Minru's continued guilt of not being able to beat the Demon King was there for so such a long time. It truly broke my heart, man. Like, really. I just thought this entire cutscene was amazing. It reminded me so much of, like, just how important, you know, sticking together is and how much you really need everybody when it comes to these battles. Because, oh my god, was I not ready to do this alone. Thank you, Tulin, for talking first, and then Unibo, Sidon, Reiju, and Minoru was last. It was just amazing. This cutscene, however, it honestly reminded me of how emotional I felt whenever I played Breath of the Wild. Now, I know what you're saying, Quinn, this is a Tears of the Kingdom. However, this is a sequel to Breath of the Wild. And in Breath of the Wild, seeing Ravali, even, again, even though I hated him, I didn't like him whatsoever, the beautiful Mifa, you know, wanting to make things up, Daruk, who calls Link little guy, very accurate, by the way, and Arbosa, the fabulous late queen of the Gerudo people, all of that mixed together, was just so beautiful and it felt so right when it came to being all synced up together and they carry that over to Tears of the Kingdom where Tulin, like I said, Unobo, Sidon, Reiju, Minoru, all of them, it made for an astounding, astounding, you know, cutscene and entryway into this, you know, this battle. Now, I bet you're wondering, Quinn, how did you feel about the other cutscene? Well, for those of you who didn't play but for some reason are still here, I guess you love to be spoiled. Anyway, after the Demon King's army is done, Gunzo, hashtag, Arino, there is another cutscene, and only because all the bosses that you have beat in the temple, they show up again. However, you don't battle them a second time or third if you have beaten them in the depths. But you don't have to do that. The sages stay behind and battle them, leaving you to go fight Ganon on your own. And honestly, this is another one of those moments that I really liked because they all came together and were just like, you know, on it. They are just like, you know what? I'm gonna make this man my B-I-T-C-H and I'm gonna show him who's boss. Also, another thing that I absolutely love before we move on from this is that before actually going to the Demon King's army, you know that the torch that Zelda was holding in the very, very beginning of the game that I'm going to show right here? Yes, that torch. Well, when you go down to finally, you know, 
slap the Demon King around a few, you will actually see the torch down there. It's just an amazing attention to detail that a lot of people wouldn't assume that they would get or a lot of people honestly wouldn't even care if they put it in there or didn't put it in there. I'm pretty sure they would have been like, well, I'm sure a monster just grabbed it, pulled it away, tore it to pieces. I don't know. They could have come up with any other thing, but they decided to add that on. And that is what makes it spectacular. And I love it. Picture this, an ancient man who desperately needs moisturizing cream sitting on top of a tower-like throne. Mocking Link that he wanted a tougher opponent, but you can't really blame him when he broke the Master Sword like it was nothing. Like it was a pasta noodle before you even get to cook it. Which reminds me, can I genuinely say that it's very irritating that this is the only time I don't see the Master Sword break or run out of energy? Really? Something that makes no sense as to why it runs out of energy beforehand. Because, like, I legit just pulled the Master Sword out of Zelda, who has been holding it for thousands and thousands of years. So, explain to me, devs, why you made such a choice. Do you know how annoying it is to have to wait 10 minutes for it to recharge when it's like, I'm pretty sure you've done all the recharging you, you can like all these years. Anyway, after some much needed magical moisturizer and steroids, he becomes beefy Cake Daddy Ganondorf. In this battle, Ganondorf will switch between four different weapons, his sword, his spike club, his spear, and his bow. During the first phase with Ganondorf, you can get a few hits off of him, but he also dodges your attacks. However, when you think it's safe to hit him, you'll probably hit him like three times, but guess what? No, he just wants you to feel safe because he'll just end up whacking you and make you have gloom damage. It's awful. It's, it's genuinely just awful. Flurry rushes are your good friend and I hope you're really good at them because you're going to need to be. I honestly am not that good with them. Either I dodge a little like a second too soon or a second too late and he just ends up hitting my shield. Like, I'm not as good with them, but in this round, I quickly had to be. Because this is a sure fire way to hit him every single time without the fear of him hitting you back. So please, practice your flurry rushes, because when I say you're going to need them, you're going to need them. Oh my god. Ah, the second phase. The second phase of the battle starts off with Ganondorf talking about how much he misses the thrill of battle. I mean, it's kind of hard not to miss it when you've been in a sleep-like state for thousands of years. But then again, wouldn't that also be a reason to, to... I don't know. It's like, how can you actually miss it? Because you've literally been asleep. For all you know, you were imprisoned yesterday. Although, again, he under underestimates Link massively. Ganondorf proceeds to threaten him again. You know, as one does. You know, it, this hurt me, Ganondorf, but it's okay. I'll let it slide. Just next time, please don't mention my arm. I'm kind of sensitive about that. In the second phase, the reason why I found this more difficult was because there are multiple phantom Ganons. You know, those annoying little things that show up after you get the gloom hands, but this time there's tons of them. However, I also found this difficult because I wouldn't stop trying to take his photo. You know what? Either or works, really. The only thing I will say about this phase was that at least the sages were there to help me. Because remember, I went for all the sages because, like I said in the beginning of the video, I am not good with video games. I suck at them. If there is any little help, I will get. I'm sorry. This phase, however, is when he starts dodging you a lot more than he did in the first phase. This is where you have to absolutely depend on the flurry rush. 
The only thing I don't like about the second phase is that you lock onto the other Phantom Ganons a lot, which honestly annoyed me. And a lot of the times you're trying to beat, you know, Ganondorf, but then you end up locking onto Phantom Ganon. It, it's just annoying, really. The only good thing about the Phantom Ganons is that they don't deplete your hearts with gloom damage. Like, they do injure you, do not get me wrong, but they don't give you gloom damage. That's just regular Ganondorf that does that. Now, after taking his extremely high health board down to the halfway point, this is where we enter the third stage of his battle, which he has enough power to basically knock out all the sages and it makes you fight him alone again. Now, this is something that I didn't mind because the sages were only really there because they needed them for the Phantom Ganons, which thank you that I went after them. Now, up until this point, I have repeated the same thing about the Flurry Rush, but in this third phase, you have to Flurry Rush twice. Yeah, that's why, that's right, not once, but twice to the point where I even stuttered on just now. He will dodge the first time and then go in for another attack right after. Also, the attack that you're seeing right now on screen literally takes your precious hearts away. They say bye 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 bye, you know, they say bye 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 to your hearts, just like in sync, because that's exactly what you're going to be doing, just say bye. Or like Elsa and be like, let it go. I was totally clueless about how to go about this because this was the one thing that kept messing me up again and again and again. It wasn't until one of the people in my chat, Zelda Pug Zelda, told me that I could parry them using my sword. All I could say is, Zelda, if you're watching this, thank you so much for your advice on both the travel medallion and on those blasted little things. You are truly the best for letting me know, and trust me, I will never forget that. After all three phases are said and done, you know, blow caution to the wind, you pretty much thinking that yourself, right? You know? Well, notice how I haven't moved on to the next chapter, that I'm still in this particular chapter, and it's because Link just finished, you know, giving the Demon King the much needed a fight that he's been waiting for, you know, and in a desperate need of self-preservation, Ganondorf swallows the secret stone and becomes a dragon, which is how we enter the fourth and final stage. However, we don't fight him alone this time. We have the help of the light dragon, aka Zelda. This is something I got that I didn't know I needed until that moment. She may have lost her memory, but she still knows she has to help defeat the Demon King and she pretty much knows that she hates his gut still, which I find really heartful and just downright beautiful. The fourth stage is literally just Link going from Zelda to Ganondorf in order to pop his warts with the Master Sword. Now. After you hit the warts like three separate times, like with one wart, you're going to want to hit it one, two, three, and then on the third one, you're going to be pushed off. However, as you're going down, Zelda is flying towards you and she'll pick you up. Obviously, you know, if you land on her head, she'll pick you up. She'll fly up into a high point and then she'll become stable until it gives you the option to dive once more. And you keep rinse and repeating that until finally, you know, after hitting the last war, the Demon King is finally brought down and there is no Demon King and there is now peace upon Hyrule. After beating the Demon King, we see the spirits of Rauru and the beautiful Queen Sonya standing above Link with the Light Dragon, which as to this point, you know it's Zelda. With their combined power, even in spirit form, they are able to restore Link's arm. Like, no offense, when I saw this, I was just like, yo, how badass 
is it that you're dead and you can still like do some cool shit however they're also able to fully bring back zelda to her human form i honestly did find this part of the ending beautiful you know to see raru and sonya still together even in spirit form in order to team up once more like it it was it was so good to because it was their form in my opinion for thanking like thanking link and zelda for everything that they have done and zelda mind you that up to this point has sacrificed so much only because of raru and sonya but she really did that fully like we know now obviously in hindsight that raru and sonya were able to basically change her back but she didn't know that she went into it fully thinking she was never going to be human again she really struggled to find a way to help raru and sonya as well as help the people in her own timeline when link skydives to zelda to basically the hopeless romantic inside of me was screaming and squealing from how my heart felt diving to her made me feel like an actual hero and for me when link started reaching out to zelda it hit me hard like a brick the reason why it did that is because it's basically a direct reflection of the beginning when he couldn't save her but this time guess what spoiler warning he did he saved her and i loved it it just really showed for me that zelda does really mean a lot to link or maybe that's just the hopeless romantic in me i have no idea but for me it showed that and yes i ship them all the way also the moment that zelda realized that she was back home and that link actually beat the demon king chef's kiss i loved it she truly believes in him and this made me cry i enjoyed this so much i'm so happy she was able to be turned back when she describes you know being like in a dream she's like oh i felt like i was in a dream and that was it it was so peaceful but i was just so happy she's just like link how are you and because it's just like was i dreaming it was just so beautiful the final cutscene we actually get after the you know credits finish rolling you know just like a marvel movie why not but anyway it shows you know raiju pora tool inside basically all the really important people they're at a sky island when minoru is explaining that it was because of raru and sonya's power that zelda was able to change back by the way can i just say it's so nice to see pora so dedicated to the sky islands that she finally got a chance to be up there for me it was also adorable to see the sages vow to help zelda serve and protect hyrule of course it was really funny when they didn't remember the words and ended up laughing about it but in my opinion this really needed to be done in order to basically ease down a lot of the tension that they have been building up essentially like within themselves it is after saying her goodbyes however that minoru does leave and zelda says that they'll have to work together in order to repair hyrule honestly i couldn't have asked for a much much better ending at all this game for me after playing you know so many hours into this game and then delving in so many hours into breath of the wild you know combined together and you know my last stream of tears of the kingdom this game has been so precious to me there is a lot of things that i like like i said the story was very beautiful however i really didn't like again that you can get them out of order i realized there is you know in the forgotten temple like i said you can get the stories in order because all you need to do is take a picture or whatever but there's a lot of people that don't do that i myself included and i know a bunch a bunch more that do the same thing um so i think this is something that for me was kind of like you know like like it i love the story but the fact that you can get them out of order is something that i didn't particularly like however you know that's me nitpicking at the end of the day 
That's not something serious that's going to be like, oh, because of this, I'm going to mark it down like freaking five points, five out of five out of ten, guys. And this game, I also liked the fact that I can bully the Koroks. Oh my god, I hated these little blasted little things. I I put them to their friends. Hold up, hold up, guys. I actually gave them to their friends a lot of the times. And sometimes I would, you know, make their airspace happen or like just drag them along the floor. You know, whatever it was. But I like that I finally got to get, you know, a little bit of revenge. But really, a thousand Korok seeds? Why do, why do we need to gather up a thousand Korok seeds? Was it 900 Korok seeds bad enough? Now we had to deal with a thousand? The horses that you can get in this game are also very beautiful. And especially the giant horse. The giant horse I didn't like the main, but again, nitpicking. That's something that, you know, I still really love it and enjoy it. The shrines for me were really good. We had a lot of Raru's blessings, which I'm not complaining about. Like, please, please, I know we're, we're not doing this today. However, one of the things that I will say, uh, speaking of shrines, that I for sure still didn't like, it still bugged me up until this point. Because as you see, I spent a fair decent amount of time in the depths. I've gotten almost every single light route available. Um, and that's from me not wanting to go there in the first place. And so I sought out to try to explore the the skies as well. I even found the infamous King Gleok because I needed to take a photo of him. However, within the Sky Islands, I thought because there was so many promotion, you know, because surrounding the sky islands and that you can go to the sky and that you can do this in the sky and that you can do that in the sky it's i expected the sky islands to play a much bigger part besides you know a place to go to get more shrines i didn't think it was utilized well i mean i'm very very happy that we had the wind temple up there we also had the water temple up there and we had basically the the way to get to the spirit temple was also up there however i don't believe the sky islands were utilized to their fullest potential like they could have been however then again i really don't see a way that they could have used it further i think at least like i don't really exactly know how it just bugged me a little bit that it's just like Okay, going to the Sky Islands. Okay, I already got that shrine. Then there was absolutely no reason for me to go to the Sky Islands. Only to go to the places where I didn't go to see if I can get, you know, more shrines. If there was any shrines that I didn't get. Or if there was like, you know, like the mission from the ancient, I think it's called ancient text or something like that. Those were the only things I needed to go to the Sky Islands for, besides like story progression. I didn't really need them. After and after going to the depths, I was very comforted by the depths for some reason. I just wish that I could have felt that same thing when it comes to the Sky Islands. There was just something missing about that that I would have loved, but that's just me. Where, you know. We could only get what we get at this point, and besides that, it was still a wonderfully, beautifully made game, and it's something that, well, just for that minor little thing, and, you know, that I really didn't like, but at least I could, like, I could fling up some Koroks, so that honestly makes up for the fact that there's hardly anything to do up there. I'm good. Anyway, guys, thank you all so much, and thank you so much if you guys have made it to the end. As you can hear, I am now sick. Uh, I honestly got sick right before I was going to record the portion for the ending chapter. And I was just like, crap, I'm sick. I really can't record because my voice sounds like I just dragged it through hell. But I decided, well, you know, why not? I'm still going to record and edit because I do want this to go up. But as I did say in the very, very, very beginning of this video, guys, 
this video was a long time coming i have been working on this video for about over a little over a month so if you can do me just like the biggest biggest favor and please you know hit a like for me subscribe if you're not subscribed already and you want to keep seeing more and if you made it to the end just comment i love cheese actually no 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 we're not going to do that just put i love koroks that's where we're going to go with if you made it to the end please guys say i love koroks because it, it was honestly as much as it took me a long time to make this um I really loved making this video. I found, again, a passion for making videos. And I couldn't be more happier. So guys, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch me. Like, you could be watching any other video, but you chose to watch mine. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. Thank you all so much. Like I said, like, subscribe, you know, if you can. If you wanna, you know, those buttons are there for you to press. Please don't let my sacrifices be in vain. Anyway, guys, thank you all so much. Remember, I do stream on Twitch. And yeah, if you want to come check me out, that would be awesome. Anyway, guys, like I said, bye. I appreciate every single strand of your hair for watching. And bye.